here with me, I have made the panel's co-host and we are ready to begin the next session. If let me is in, uh, all right, great. I see everyone's video looks great. And I'll uh, leave it up to Lamy. Thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to it. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my pleasure to welcome you. Uh, for those of you who've tuned in uh, from around the world, uh, we have a very insightful discussion uh, prepared for you and are looking forward to engaging in this course. Um, the aim of this panel is to explore particularly how uh, strategic communications can be uh, used to uh, as an effective tool for uh, advocacy and particularly in fighting disinformation and countering narratives. Um, often you may hear the saying that uh, perception is reality and this is this is where uh, we we deal with how perception uh, and how people engage and uh, interact with information and disinformation influences uh, their decision on various issues. And uh, I, I don't need to uh, remind anyone or emphasize, uh, especially over the last uh, two years with uh, so much happening uh, around our world, uh, just the current state of affairs, uh, how much of that has really uh, been true. And so uh, during these challenging times, uh, really grateful to have advocates who work tirelessly and thanklessly uh, to lead by example and deliver results for, uh, for their communities, for their cause. And uh, advocacy is so multidimensional uh, and there are many aspects to it. And uh, throughout this panel discussion, we will hear from experts, activists, and organizers who play a role in evolving and uh, innovating advocacy. And it's my pleasure with that to introduce to you um, our panelists and special guests. Um, our special guest, we have uh, Colonel uh, Miles Kaggins III of the US Army. Currently, he serves as a military fellow at uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, specializing in uh, informa public information warfare and also uh, U.S. Kurdish relations. And prior to that, uh, Colonel Ma uh, Kagans has uh, served as the director of public affairs for and uh, spokesman for at Fort Hood in Texas. Um, he was the spokesman for the global coalition to defeat ISIS in Iraq and Iran, or in Syria, excuse me. Um, he's also served uh, as the, uh, uh, at the White House as National Security uh, Council spokesman for Asia, defense affairs, Guantanamo, human rights, and non-proliferation and uh, also uh, served as various roles as spokesman uh, at the Pentagon and has uh, earned a bachelor's degree uh, in history from Hampton University and has also uh, earned his master's in public relations from Georgetown University and has also completed the Harvard Kennedy School's National Security Fellows Program. And amongst uh, many distinguished uh, accomplishments in his service. Uh, it is also rumored that uh, Colonel Kagans is also an Airbnb super host. I've yet to experience that, but uh, hopefully one day we'll all have that pleasure uh, to do so. So um, I introduce um, Colonel uh, Kagans III as um, our, our special guest. And then uh, joining us on the panel uh, are um, Marartu Kedila, who 
uh, has been greatly convening our uh, conference. And um, uh, maybe she needs no introduction, but uh, just in case, uh, Maratu is a, a normal American raised and uh, living in uh, Washington DC area. By profession, she's a speech pathologist, but also extremely involved in various efforts for advocacy and is passionate about using messaging and communications to uh, advance the uh, Oromo struggle um, in the country and abroad. And uh, I have uh, a great experience uh, working alongside uh, Maro on various advocacy efforts and can attest to her uh, great civic engagement um, and looking forward to uh, getting her uh, powerful voice and insights on, on this panel. And as well, uh, joining me, uh, joining us is uh, Fatuma Badaso, who is uh, a community organizer uh, and an activist. And her uh, role uh, and, and her um, advocacy has really uh, been around finding voices uh, in, in uh, uh, the sphere of uh, the, the public sphere, particularly social media and uh, other mediums where uh, contributing to discourse positively. Her, uh, she's currently a law student at Regents University and um, her advocacy has uh, shaped around uh, changing narratives and um, fighting disinformation. And so uh, from our panelists and special guests would get to hear uh, their particular uh, experiences in uh, this arena, but also uh, what the expert analysis is and, and what strategies that we can use to not only be effective advocates, but um, be able to use the, these tools to uh, to push forward. So uh, without further ado, we can um, get started. I will uh, give the floor over to uh, Colonel Taggins uh, to kick us off. Thank you, uh, Lemmy. I look forward to addressing you as doctor soon. I appreciate the invite here to spend time with you all on a Saturday afternoon to address the important uh, topics at hand. And uh, by a little way of introduction, some years ago when I was at the White House, I bumped into Lemmy in a hallway and he was making such a difference there as a young man. And we've stayed in touch over the years and life has brought me to New York where I'm posted at the Council on Foreign Relations. And over the arc of my life and the arc of my career, I, I understood uh, the power of communication. So I am an army colonel as mentioned. And what what um, I do in the Army and the teams I've been privileged to lead, we are public information warriors. We are words warriors. And the war of words, the war of ideas is essential for the success of any organization, be it uh, large governments or nation states like the United States. Uh, we can also see Ukraine and Russia involved in a significant information warfare, corporations, or even uh, things as simple as, as a lot of you all are involved in universities and you made a choice of where to go to school based on receiving some sort of information or, or marketing. So none of this is, is new. And today I would like to uh, spend a little bit of time talking to you about strategic communication and, and a couple of examples that I've seen of successful advocacy uh, from, from non-American groups. Um, and finally, I want to encourage all of the, the guests here who, who care to do what you can in your own way, be it reach out on social media, um, help build a stakeholder relationships, and think about different ways to ensure that this discussion that has a uh, hundred or so guests uh, expands out to uh, tens of thousands or millions of people. And we want to make sure that the right people know about the plight of the Ormo people. Um, so, so strategic communications is essentially uh, talking and communicating the, 
the objective of your group, of your organization, through stakeholders in a way that is intentional to achieve desired uh, goals and, and outcomes. Uh, more, more narrowly defined or layperson's ways, you, you want to say things that people listen to, and based on them listening, they take action to what you, you say. I've had an opportunity uh, in recent years as when I was posted in Iraq as the spokesman for the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS to work uh, cross culture in a region that I'm not native to. I'm an American, I'm black American is, is my identity and a black American soldier. And there I was in Baghdad having to connect with Arab and Kurdish audiences in uh, Iraq and Syria and even the broader region. I was working on a behalf of a, a coalition that included 78 nations and five international organizations uh, and in multiple languages. During my time in Iraq, I tweeted in, I think, 14 or 15 different languages. I don't speak 14 or 15 languages, but I had plenty of help and understood that that messages needed to be heard um, by all as many stakeholder, stakeholders as possible. Drilling down a little bit, the uh, people of that region include uh, Kurds. Kurdish people live about 40 million Kurdish people are split between four nations going from east to west, uh, Iran, Iraqi Kurdistan, which is in Northern Iraq, um, Southeastern Turkey and North uh, West or North and West Syria. And so Kurds are a group of people who at currently and at various times in history have been oppressed by the nation states or the larger, more powerful groups around them. Uh, this oppression includes things that, that you all are familiar with, uh, the inability to speak their native language, inability to seek uh, restrictions on seeking political office, uh, lack of access to opportunities for education and employment, um, sometimes direct violence, wrongful imprisonment, harsh imprisonment, um, subject to, to uh, racism, hate, hateful talk, rhetoric, uh, efforts to split up families and uh, depopulate areas to move in other groups. So all of the, the types of state sanctioned oppression, the worst, worst kind of it other than maybe chattel slavery that we uh, have seen in the United States uh, in across the continent of Africa, Europe, and everywhere else that humans exist. This happens to Kurdish people today. Uh, Kurdish people, though, uh, it leveraged uh, in particular the war against ISIS as a way to gain more credibility and prominence with the United States and the West. How was this done? Some of it was just by happenstance, by geography, where ISIS was fighting, and there was a a town called Kobani, which is in north central Syria, just uh, borders with Turkey. And the United States was looking for a partner against ISIS as ISIS had swept across Iraq and Syria in 2013 and 14 uh, and 15 and taken over 110,000 square kilometers of land. Kurdish uh, forces were fighting to defend their homeland in Kobani. The U.S. and Global Coalition had an interest in defeating ISIS, and th through some key stakeholder meetings, uh, the Kurds were able to have access through political partnerships to reach uh, U.S. special operations leaders to uh, forge a relationship. This relationship was forged in spite of uh, public and diplomatic opposition and pressure from Turkey. Uh, the nation state of Turkey, who's a NATO ally of the United States, uh, and against the, the politics of the United States where President Obama at the time in 2014 was assuring Americans that we would not put troops on the ground in large numbers in Syria or Iraq. But out of their advocacy of the Kurds and including uh, effective public relations, effective stakeholder engagement, uh, effective storytelling and branding, they have become a continued partner of the United States today, uh, where we have bases in North and East Syria, uh, and also in 
uh, Iraqi Kurdistan and northern parts of Iraq, cities like Erbil and Soleimani. Uh, there are more than 200 million American tax dollars pumped in for military aid uh, to Kurds, Kurdish-led security forces in Syria. And uh, over the past six or seven or so years, uh, there's been more than a billion dollars in military aid pumped into the Peshmerga, including uh, stipends in Iraqi Kurdistan. I'm speaking a lot about the military, but there are common threads here for all groups that are um, oppressed, uh, minority groups um, that are lessons that can be learned. You've got to have friends. You've got to have friends. So how do you make those friends from people who are may not have any interest in the region? Uh, how do you make friends across language and across culture? And uh, what I have seen is that effective storytelling and getting people to buy in on shared values is a way to, to create those friendships. But you still need to have the, the effective um, ambassadors and liaisons to get inside the door, make those handshakes and get around the table to build that advocacy. And when that's done, things can flow from it, but it takes time. Sometimes it's in extremists. Civil wars uh, create a situation of extremists where people are dying, bombs are dropping, and actions need to be taken uh, quickly. And even with that, there are teams that will pick sides. Uh, let's shift over to Ukraine. We all see, uh, a lot of us who are beyond this Zoom session, see with an eyebrow raised of how much the Western world, Europe, the United States, uh, Australia, Japan, South Korea, has rallied around Ukraine. It seems that no amount of money can be spared to, to aid to Ukraine. I've seen more sunflowers and blue and yellow flags on Facebook and Twitter feeds uh, than I could ever imagine for the people of, of Ukraine. We wonder why is it that we don't see this type of response in East Africa and the Horn of Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa in the Middle East when people are experiencing the same type of uh, violence put, put against civilians, of uh, forced famine put against civilians, of water used as a weapon against civilians, why is there not the same response? I think we kind of know the answer. A lot of this is straight up based on uh, who controls the media, the Western media and the identity of uh, race. And, and there still though can be a way to overcome that by uh, sharing the identity of, of common values and human values and human rights. And this just has to be worked over and over and over and over again. I'd like to go through one more example of, uh, of a successful uh, group, minority group that used information to build public awareness and uh, create a difference for, for their outcomes, at least in the short, short term. In the early 90s in Mexico, uh, there was a group called the Zapatistas who were who were oppressed and neglected by the central Mexican government. And over the years, this was a, uh, you could call them almost an insurgent group, a, a rebel group. And uh, there became a point where there was uh, resistance with the police. And, and from this, there was an opportunity to, that came about to bring the plight of the Zapatistas to the uh, broader world. And that opportunity came about through media. So there's a, an interesting figure in uh, history. And he calls himself a self-dubbed uh, sub, subcomandante Marcus. You should Google him sometime. And this guy became the spokesman for this, this revolution in Southern Mexico. And he was so effective as a spokesman that he ended up, and this is back in 1994, this is before TikTok, before YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, he ended up being able to really rally the world's attention on the plight of uh, indigenous and impoverished people in Mexico. Did this by relentless engagement with media, uh, by connecting the 
spite of the Zapatistas with other groups that were involved in struggles, sometimes communist-based struggles around the world. And the group, no kidding, would make newsletters and send out dispatches by fax machine, fax machine all across the world to similar groups, but also to all the news editors around the world, good old fashioned fax machine. So in a, in a world where there's not much information coming in, if you get these tales of the plight and the struggle and the resistance, it started to get interest. It, in sub, uh, Comandante Marcos eventually ended up with a big profile in Vanity Fair and interviews with Ed Bradley on 60 Minutes and the world paid attention. What did the state do? State of Mexico wants to squash these voices. So when they squashed the voices and when they went directly after this, this charismatic and mysterious spokesman, it ended up proving the point that the Zapatistas were making that the state was oppressing them and they didn't stand a chance and there were massive human rights violations. So there was blowback on the state from clamping down on the opposition uh, in such a violent and, and unfair way. And there are lessons that we can all learn from the Zapatistas. I'll tick through them. Uh, one is that if you connect with like-minded groups uh, and use the, the, the synergy and the energy of all, you can raise uh, greater awareness. I, I recall some years ago, I was here in New York and passed by the Occupy Wall Street move, movement uh, and Zuccotti Park. And there were people there who were, uh, who were railing against income inequality, but there are also people advocating for women's rights, people advocating for clean energy uh, and combating uh, um, global warming. So a whole lot of groups came together under one umbrella to raise awareness for their issues. Zapatistas also leveraged a uh, charismatic spokesman, and so all groups can benefit from having charismatic uh, on-camera spokespeople and uh, playing up the underdog narrative. It's common in stories across the world, the underdog narrative. Everybody likes a hero. Uh, you can think of in the Christian tradition in the Bible of David versus Goliath, but there are those similar stories in all, all cultures and all languages. So that's uh, my opening. I look forward to the, the further discussion uh, and your questions a little later on. Thank you, Colonel. Um, next up, we'll hand the floor over to Marartu, who's uh, been convening, and we will um, get her perspective and uh, 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 Fatima following that, and we will uh, then jump to the discussion portion of it, and we'd love to uh, also get your questions. So uh, if, uh, if the chat um, is enabled for uh, folks to submit questions, I'll do my best in uh, facilitating and, and uh, getting those questions to the panelists so that we can have a wholesome discussion. Maratu? Thank you, Lemmy, and thank you, Colonel Kaggins. That was a really uh, informative presentation that you shared with us and gave me a lot of things to think about. I was taking some notes. Um, I don't have any remarks prepared, but you know, just generally speaking from my uh, experience, I think that some things, you know, without any official training in this area or without any necessarily professional experience. Um, some of the things that um, my colleagues and I have learned through trial and error, through research um, and implemented and that we have seen to be beneficial is for one, really tailoring our messaging to the specific audience. Um, and so a lot of our work comes through in the you know social media realm or just like the online space in general um, trying to have more not necessarily the the diplomatic types of uh you know connections and and conversations but also just on the smaller scale um, and also just in the more public sphere as well um, and so 
one thing that's really apparent and a lesson that we've learned is that the, the same kind of messaging does not apply to every audience. Um, so if you're speaking to people who really have no you know, connection to the issue that you're advocating about, um, presenting it in a way that is not you know, overwhelming. I think we have a tendency in our community to, um, because we're so passionate about, you know, the topic and because it really means a lot to us, we kind of lose sight of the fact that someone else doesn't have that, that context background or connection to the issue. Um, and so instead of getting caught up in our own perspective, taking the perspective of that potential audience member, the person that you want to hear what you're saying and take action on it and actually become an ally to that cause. Um, and thinking of it in terms of more of a marketing perspective and how you can actually persuade that person um, to, you know, not only listen to what you're saying, but also actually care about it and want to support your cause. Um, so, you know, figuring out how to condense the context necessary into, you know, a more palatable and um, digestible format is one thing. Um, and then also not just simply stating the truth, but presenting it in a way that inherently demonstrates um, how that fits into a lot of fallacies and, you know, the disinformation that is out there. Um, because one major hurdle, especially for any advocacy related to, you know, Oromo issues is that there is a massive uh, disinformation campaign a uh, massive propaganda campaign that is actively contradicting everything that Oromo communities are advocating for. Um, and so, you know, it's one thing to say these, you know, 50 individuals in this town uh, were killed by state forces, but when you're trying to advocate and or raise awareness for this issue or advocate for something to change to prevent that from happening again. Um, and you have another group that's actually, you know, saying that that exact um, incident was actually perpetrated by the group that you're saying is the victim. Um, and so not just, you know, raising or, you know, trying to advocate for it, but also actively combating the propaganda, um, it, it becomes really challenging. And it, it also kind of adds that psychological component to it. So I would say those are some of the main takeaways uh, that I've experienced, especially in the past couple of years. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Mara. And, um, <clears throat> so just to, uh, to, to clarify, I misspoke by uh, saying submit your questions on chat and realized that it is a, a tough task to try to get all the questions. So the best way uh, to do is to use the reactions feature and raise your hands as such uh, when you have questions. And uh, if, if you have questions, uh, this is meant to be an engaging uh, panel. So, um, Please, uh, please use that feature as much as you can. Uh, we definitely don't want to just be talking at you. We we want to talk and discuss with you. So if there are questions that are that are coming up, um, please use that feature uh, of raising hands to to address those. And um, uh, at the moment, uh, one of our uh, co-panelist is having some connection issues. Uh, so she uh, is not able to uh, get on. And while she gets taken care of 
that uh, I'd uh, like to just uh, thank both uh, Colonel uh, Kagans and, and Marartu for uh, sharing their perspective and experience on this. And also just <clears throat> would like to share a bit of uh, my own perspective um, and what, have, what I have experienced uh, in this realm of advocacy. Uh, starting out, you know, I, I, I mentioned that advocacy is multidimensional. Uh, and, and there are various aspects of uh, advocacy that we often don't see. Uh, sometimes advocacy can come in a good old fashioned uh, demonstration or pro uh, protest. And uh, we uh, might go and, and write letters and uh, various campaigns. As, as Marartu had mentioned, it could be uh, an, an all out uh, marketing uh, and advertising scheme. But what uh, often is gets missed in advocacy is the, the, the narrative that that storytelling piece of how do we uh, make friends in the right places, but also how do we uh, engage with those who are putting out that disinformation and counter those in a way that is diplomatic, but also firm in our principles and values. And when we initially react to something, uh, then we sort of take off that advocate hat because now we are reacting in how that particular disinformation or particular campaign is impacting us personally on that emotional level. And so having these dimensions, uh, and, and this could be uh, to, to, to both of you, uh, Marutu and um, uh, Colonel Kagans, uh, what strategies have you guys used to navigate around uh, disinformation? What, what, what were helpful things as you have seen um, storylines come in, as you've seen various campaigns come uh, in, in the lack of uh, accepting responsibility uh, come, what is it that have helped uh, you guys navigate around uh, the story to be able to make uh, a sound judgment and, and, and decisions on how you were going to, to respond? Uh, I'd like to I'd like to know that. And then we have our first question. So I'll hand the floor to, to you guys to, to answer that. And I will get that question. Teed up. Uh, on the uh, question of disinformation, the, the principle that I recommend for all groups and uh, that I've used as much as I can in the government is to speak first. So the mentality that I lead communications teams with is that we seek to dominate the information environment with weaponized truth, weaponized truth. So we speak first and then our adversaries have to react to what we're saying and we're speaking in a truthful way. So if you're able to uh, preempt disinformation, you've done pretty well for yourself in a, a war of words and a war of ideas. But sometimes there's the, when the adversary gets out ahead, uh, we have to combat that by responding as fast as possible with as many facts as possible in a compelling way. And there could be different scenarios where you're just putting out straightforward information to, to correct the record, or other times it goes even further where you want to ridicule somebody who is smearing your, your group. But again, uh, leading out with information first and being very fast and then communicating across cultures. If you have to communicate and send social media messages, uh, video messages, or, or good old fashioned press releases uh, to get the attention of other people, do it in multiple languages uh, to, to make it as easy for broader international audiences to distill and, and share what content uh, you're being, you're presenting. Yeah, that's a that's a really excellent piece of advice. And what immediately came to my mind as you brought that up is how many um, 
kind of destructive public discussions that we've seen uh, take place, you know, where some media outlet invites, you know, different individuals to speak on events in Ethiopia, for example, um, from different angles. And you can see in real time how this plays out. And we've seen individuals, you know, speak first and spew, you know, completely fabricated statistics with absolutely no basis uh, or no relationship to what's actually happening on the ground. And, but once that's out there, once that's stated, um, it kind of puts the other person, even if, you know, they're speaking from a, a truthful and genuine standpoint on the defensive. Um, and so I think that's a really important takeaway for all of us, you know, whether it's even, you know, in a, in a conversation or, you know, regardless of the venue um, or the platform, we're all, you know, trying to advocate in, in different avenues. So I really hope that those who are listening to this um, can take that away, um, that we don't want to put ourselves in the situation of being on the defense because not only are you trying to make your case, you're also trying to disprove something that's been put out there, whether it was genuinely put out there, you know, to assert that information or as a distraction, um, but either way it's, you know, it's become both in that context. Um, and I think, you know, as you said, you know, if you don't speak first, your next line of defense is to present your facts in a compelling way. Um, and so I think that, again, comes back to tailoring your message and, um, you know, honing in on the key components that will not only demonstrate what, you know, the information that you have factually, but also trying to present it in a way that is combating the disinformation. Um, and so some, you know, some of, you know, the research that my colleagues and I have done is into different forms of fallacies so that, you know, not only understanding that, you know, we know this information is disinformation because um, we have spoken to people on the ground. We, you know, we have different sources um, and we can verify the information that we know to be true. Um, but when you're presented with that disinformation, how do you communicate to other people that it is in fact disinformation or it's propaganda? Um, and in order to be able to communicate to others, you know, what exactly is, is being done to distort reality, you have to be able to understand that so that you can then break it down um, and respond in a way that speaks to that. Um, so that's, that's also something that um, I've found to be useful. Excellent. Um, but both, both really uh, great insights. Um, uh, we do have a question and uh, it, it, this is such a wonderful platform to really engage in this type of discussion with because uh, the, the, the whole room, what I see is it's organizers and activists and uh, scholars and uh, as we as we take uh, questions, uh, just uh, want to uh, to remind you all that that every bit of effort that is made uh, to to being able to share that story, we do this on the daily basis, uh, just in our everyday relationships, making our compelling cases, whether we're going to work. Um, or uh, carrying up on and, and checking checking on uh, friends and, and family members. We're we're advocating, and so uh, as we advocate, we use different strategies to be able to uh, to be able to connect and uh, navigate around those issues and and how we are able to uh, put ourselves up. And so, I'll uh, go ahead and.
hold on the order in which I see the hands. Um, I am going to uh, give the floor to Dr. Ebisa uh, for, for your question. And who- Okay, thank you so much, Lamy. Uh, and the panelists, I really appreciate it because this is the area where um, we have little experience on, so we're shooting from the hip when it comes to the advocacy. And, and it's really great uh, to have you guys on the panel, especially at this time where the situation in the country, uh, even in, in Horn of Africa is really in really terrible state of affair. Um, I'd like to pose some uh, direct question, especially to the Colonel. Um, so where do we begin to tell our story, for instance, you know, that, uh, where, where do you begin? Do you begin from the history, from your experience since you've been in this field for quite a while? Do you begin from the history, from the culture, or do you begin from the present crisis and then highlight that? And then to whom do we share this kind of story to what institution, if, if, if you will? Where would it make a greater impact for the general public? to tell our stories. And you're right, we are having a difficult time telling our stories, probably not addressing it in a way that may get greater attention, but we are beginning to see some leeways, uh, <clears throat> seeing some headwinds right now. Um, so if, if you could give us a little insight on that, uh, one of the things I think Maro and you also have highlighted is there's this pre-existing narrative that is that we are trying to overcome while at the same time telling our story. And one of the things we have observed, especially in the scholarly organization is that um, I think what we've seen is that the narrative or the change that we are seeking in the region, it actually benefits both the United States and the Western countries and to bring peace and stability to the people. But we are, it, it is becoming difficult to get this across, to get this fact across to policymakers and the, the public. So do you think approaching simply fact, facts-based or more persuasive type of approach would benefit us in terms of highlighting this, you know, mutual benefit that we may gain by bringing peace and stability to that country. And of course, as you may know, the Ethiopia mystique, what's been known about Ethiopia to the Western countries, especially in throughout the world, is not what actually is in reality. And in what way can we overcome this historical um, narrative uh, to bring the true history of Ethiopia and the condition that their people are in? I know it's a it's a mouthful. There are some quest there are other questions that I've received from other advocates. Um, it basically falls in this line that how could why hasn't you know? The right narrative haven't worked. Is it lack of media? Is it lack of information? These are some of the questions I'm receiving through my text to forward to you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Abisa. Colonel. Yep. Uh, thanks for your uh, your question. I, I got jotted it down as where do we begin telling the story? Uh, one, is your, one is yours was, do we start with the history of the current crisis? This is first, uh, I'm a practitioner of uh, public information warfare, and I do it on behalf of the U.S. government. So it's a different position than I'm in than an advocate, uh, advocacy group. Uh, and usually I'm speaking from a position of strength, even if I'm in a position as being a foreigner in a foreign land. It's just what comes with the U.S flag and wearing red, white, and blue on my sleeve. Uh, but I will offer this to you based on what I know about the Kurdish people and my, my um, 
ongoing relationships with the Kurdish community and understanding of recent Kurdish history. I, I think the best choice, given a choice of do we start with the history, start with the current crisis, is start with the crisis. Human nature and the nature of, of communications, mass media and social media really likes crisis. The imagery of crisis uh, stands out. So if you take the 40 million or so or more people, I know you'll fact check me, maybe 35 million, 50 million uh, people. That's a large group of people in Ethiopia. But as I've been an American all my life and uh, understanding just this much about Ethiopian history, I broadly see, oh, Ethiopia, that's the nation in the Horn of Africa that never was subjected to uh, colonialism. And so they must be doing well. There was a famine a few years ago back in the 80s that was pretty sad. Had people raise money and now there's a civil war and I hear Tigray, 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 Tigray uh, as the only people who've been victimized in this civil war. So I think going to the current crisis and explaining the um, civil war as more broadly affecting uh, different groups, including or people, it will be essential to raise awareness and that awareness will have to be raised with imagery, cross-cultural, cross-language communication. Why hasn't it worked thus far? Mm, I think part of it is just broadly the West or the United States uh, American-centric, Eurocentric, white-centric view of what happens with the brown and black people. It's difficult to understand. And this perception that those people are always at war anyway, why do we need to care about it? Well, clearly there's human rights is a principle that should transcend all religious groups, all geographic locations, all racial groups, men and women, young and old. Um, and the, the principles set out in the United Nations, uh, the Geneva, Geneva Conventions, any other international organization says that violations of human rights are bad. Civilians shouldn't be attacked. Civilians shouldn't be put into famine. Uh, civilians shouldn't have terrorism. Civilians shouldn't be wrongfully imprisoned for political reasons. I don't believe anybody would dispute that in Washington, D.C., or media centers like New York or London, or Paris, or Tokyo, or, or Beijing. But then how do we get people to care about it? That's the big pressing issue of the day. How do we raise awareness to get somebody to take action, to intervene, to provide aid, uh, to do anything to alleviate the suffering of Oromo people or more broadly any other groups who are wrongfully subjugated by their governments or other groups. Just to add a little bit on, on what I said at the outset, uh, I think this is about the stakeholder engagement and it has to be a sophisticated way. It doesn't always require money, right? Everybody can't be APAC and just have all the money to pump into to congressional campaigns. Sometimes it can be having the right celebrity influencer be the advocate. Sometimes the proper media figure is the advocate. Sometimes you get a, a young person like uh, Greta Thunberg, the climate activist. She's not the only climate activist. She's a relatively new young person but she is able to command a lot of attention because she presents a compelling story. And, and I would uh, offer to you um, that youth are important in this because youth are digital natives. There are people on this line who are half my age, some even younger, who are probably extremely active on, on TikTok and Instagram. And youth voices, uh, can be listened to and can leverage the power of communication in authentic ways, in compelling ways, in short sound bites that can be received uh, by other people. We can see that Gen Z, uh, Generation Z, has been able to uh, get attention in the United States, particularly if you think back to the uh, Parkland High School shooting in Florida and how those young people uh, not only walked out of their schools, but, but made demands of the governor of Florida and then marched all the way to Washington, D.C. Now, how much change with, with gun violence in the United States? Not much. But did they raise a lot of awareness? Absolutely, they raised a lot of awareness. 
and caused debate all the way into the Oval Office at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. So uh, leveraging youth voices, I think, is definitely important. And I'll pause there. I know there's a lot of hands raised, so we'll try to get through as many questions as we can today. And I appreciate the discussion too. I don't have all the answers, but I, I'm here as uh, somebody who's lived in this space and has a, uh, has a dispassionate view toward the need to advocate and communicate successfully. Yeah, we, we have uh, a lot. So um, I will alternate uh, to, to ask some questions. Uh, so please be patient with me here as I uh, go through. Uh, next up on my screen is uh, Marta uh, Kumsa, who's um, got the hands raised. Oh, Lord. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was just lowering my hand <laughs> because there were so many people. I just. I'm, I'm sorry, Miss. Miss uh... Could I interrupt for just a second? I think Fat Fatima have also joined us. Okay. Uh, she will get prepared. In the meantime, please uh, proceed with your question. Uh, thank you so much. I just want to make that announcement. Okay. I was just, okay. So I just wanted to um, ask the question from the other side of the, um, the advocacy. Um, when, about, about disinformation, right? When there is, when the adversary is purposely sitting there and throwing at you fire bombs after fire bombs after fire bombs of disinformation, you're trying to put out some fire. Before you put out that fire, another one is on you, on you already. Another one and another one, and that's what we've been dealing with recently in the last couple of years uh, uh, in terms of Ethiopian governments or government operatives throwing at us constantly, forget preempting and doing it ourselves first. Even we, we can't even catch up with the, with the number of um, disinformation that continues to come at us. And it's, it's, it's a very hard thing. And it repeating that really becomes the norm and that norm becomes accepted on the other side. And, and the people we want to reach have already absorbed all of that. And that has become a fact. How do, and, and, and to be honest, there is no willingness to reach down to the bottom of things and, and look at the truth, as you were saying earlier, the, 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 the truth that we're trying to present because they have already taken all of these untruths already. They are saturated, more than saturated with the, with the false, with the disinformation already. How do you, how do you, how do you deal with that? And that's, that's the biggest frustration we've been facing. And I don't even know how to ask this, uh, pose this as a question, but that is what we're dealing with. And, I don't know if there's any strategy of moving the immovable from the other side. I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but this is what we've been dealing with. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kue. And I just wanted to add also, <laughs> uh, Dr. Kue, along with Bontu Galeta, um, published a, an interesting article on this topic in the Awash Post last year. Um, it was called, the devastating impacts of Orwellian misinformation on Oromos. And I just wanted to point this out in case anyone was not aware of it, because I think it's a very nice comprehensive overview of um, the act, you know, providing examples of how, of the types of misinformation and disinformation that are out there and also the specific ways in which they impact Oromo people. On uh, thanks for your question, ma'am. On this relentless uh, propaganda that comes to you, um, a bit on what happens in the the Kurdish experience is that it, let's take Turkey for instance. The propaganda and the disinformation is it starts even from the state in academic institutions. So 
students across Turkey are indoctrinated into Turkish state rhetoric that strips away cultural identity of Kurds and they can't speak in the language in their home in their schools. If they do, they'll be disciplined um, and sometimes even, even jailed. There's just this past weekend where Nowruz celebrations across Turkey by Kurdish people. And some people flew certain banners and they were put in jail just for flying banners at a, at a um, celebration. Then there's also the relentless assault from the media that says, well, these people are not as smart, they're criminal, uh, they shouldn't be listened to, they're a bunch of liars. And so it goes deeply into the psyche of culture. So it goes beyond just some, some government elites and the people who control the media, it gets burrowed all the way into, into culture and how people are, are raised. Is there a solution for this? I don't think that there's a solution, a quick solution for combating all of this, uh, but some ways that it can go beyond just going, you know, press release for press release is, uh, as you're aware, uh, intellectual leadership, which can include speeches, op-eds, outreach to think tanks, uh, but also sometimes culture and art uh, and film and poetry and photography as a way to get other people in the world interested in the topic and the plight of the Ormo and uh, have them be look at the, the crisis independently and come to their own conclusions, but drawing them in in different ways other than standard political talk or uh, in media engagement. But it's a, it's a wicked problem without any quick solutions. And I don't know of any historical examples where one group has been able to, to turn around um, propaganda in one night. And we see even, we can take an, an example from, you talk about how some things are stead by the state and go viral and take off. We, we just had in Ukraine, maybe a month ago, a situation where it was uh, reported that a UK Ukrainian fighter pilot had shot down five Russian jets. Well, it was completely untrue. And the Ukrainian government didn't knock it down. So it created this mystique and people following Ukraine and thinking that all Ukrainians are heroes and good people. And it just lived in ways and was spread by people who didn't know the facts. Um, and depending on what side you're on in that conflict, uh, was just another example of how uh, untruths or, or deception or uh, propaganda can, can change outcomes of what other stakeholders or interested parties believe um, for warring factions. I hope, uh, I hope those of you who've uh, been raising your hands are not uh, too tired from keeping them up. Uh, please do write your questions down and we will do our best to, to get to each one of you. Um, the next up when, when we take questions will be uh, work in it. And uh, before that though, I would like to uh, welcome our uh, co-panelist uh, Fatuma Badaso, who would, I'd introduced uh, as, a, as an active <coughs> organizer and, uh, and also activist. Uh, she will be uh, giving us uh, or sharing a bit of insights on her experience uh, with uh, countering and, and uh, shaping narrative and, and countering disinformation. Um, so when you are ready, uh, hope you are given the privileges of, there we go. Can you guys hear me? Okay, sorry. First, I would like to apologize. I just had a lot going on and I didn't account for a lot of things. So I'm coming to you from inside a car, which is, you know, my op opinion, I'm professional, but this is the circumstances I'm in. Um, and it looks like a lot has been said before I joined, uh, but I have a feeling it's mostly it will echo my own thoughts. Um, and so my experience in the advocacy space has been kind of what I heard the colonel touch on and also uh, Martha's uh, quick as a question also reflects uh, my experience in that space. 
Um, and key to that is um, positionality. Um, when it comes to Oromo advocacy, we're always advocating uh, from a, a, a weaker uh, position. And as uh, Kwe Kumsa pointed out, it's always defensive because there's just so much onslaught of disinformation and propaganda um, from you know state medias, governments, and you know even you know average citizens uh, because there has been so much propaganda on the Oromo question. Um, the Oromo issue is within the context of Ethiopia and how Oromos are perceived by the general public, which uh, is typically you know the Fimfine uh, Addis elites who see the Oromo and the Oromo question um, as an existential threat to them and their ideals for Ethiopia. So it's always been very defensive and we're always uh, advocating from a place of um, uh, weakness just because back home, we weren't able to have institutions that reflect us. Uh, we weren't able to build institutions that you know can articulate um, our issues or even our existence within that state. And so when you have regime, all, all powerful regime, um, state medias and private medias who on a daily basis um, spew out, you know, anti oromo or what we call oromophobic um, propaganda and narratives. And when, um, you know, even expats and uh large international media uh, correspondents who, in my opinion, never leave the capital, have been indoctrinated with negative um, narratives uh, regarding the Oromo. We're basically fighting an uphill battle at every stage. Um, as uh, I think uh, Maratha has also touched on, um, when we're advocating, um, we're first and foremost, trying to change misconceptions about the Oromo before we even get to the issue in which we're making the asks, right? Even before we get to the asks, we're having to, you know, dispel a lot of false um, impressions of the Oromo as a people, particularly the Oromo question in the political context. So it's, it's a frustrating thing. Advocacy in general itself is very slow, which can be frustrating. Um, there are, you know, there's no direct or clear path to get to getting what you're advocating for. Um, so it's a lot worse and exhausting when you're doing it from the position that Oromos have been, you know, forced to, you know, uh, fight from. And so uh, my experience has been that what worked to some extent is building relationships, which is a key component of advocacy in itself is, you know, starting with just individuals and trying to also um, address um, institutions in which I believe even uh, international institutions, um, the human rights body internationally has embedded within them um, people who harbor um, an Ethiopianist view of Ethiopia's politics, which is antithetical to the Oromo question, which is, you know, uh, for a, a fed, what we call a federalist position or um, self-determination position. Um, and so even trying to build, you know, relationships with these organizations, which to some extent I see progress myself speaking uh, as me, but there's still so much that we have to dispel first in order to be heard because if I say I'm an, I'm an, I'm an activist from the Oromo community, I'm already seen as not objective. Like I am, I am obviously, you know, uh, biased towards the Oromo position and it, it's just, I'm not given the benefit of the doubt. Like my truth is not necessarily regarded as truth, you know, and those who, um, control a lot of the narrative and frame uh frame you know the narratives on Ethiopia are usually urban raised um Ethiopianist groups who have for a long time been privileged enough to build even personal relationships with people in very powerful positions 
So automatically, if I approach these organizations and these individuals as an Oromo advocate or as an Oromo activist or speaking on behalf of the Oromo, I'm already seen as biased and a proponent of, you know, uh, the destruction of Ethiopia. That is like, without me even saying two more than two sentences, I'm seen as somebody who is a secessionist because that is the narrative that has been uh, framed for a long time. So, you know, we've been put in a position where we have to dispel those uh, uh, narratives that exist and at the same time fighting these onslaught of incessant propaganda um, and misconceptions about the Oromo. So it's been an uphill battle, but um, I do see also we have been progressing uh, in these last couple of years, but the ba- but we're still, um, by virtue of being Oromos within Ethiopia, will fighting an upward, you know, uphill battle. And um, it can be exhausting, but also that is the nature of advocacy is that progress is very slow. Uh, there isn't really a clear solution. Um, and you have to build a, a kind of power that continuously pushes it. And that's, you know, when you're advocating from our position, it's not as easy, but it, I think there is change in that space that I've, from my experience. Excellent. Thank you uh, so much, Fatima. And uh, we are certainly glad that you can uh, make the adjustments necessary to join us. And uh, it is important to have your voice on this. Um, um, as, as, as well as everyone else that's present on this platform today. The, uh, I think for me, you, you've captured that uh, and, and encapsulated kind of everything that, that morphs into why advocacy is so important because it does go to show the need for institutions, particularly for us to cultivate uh, new uh, relationships, bring in the non-traditionally included voices. We are, are just in, in, uh, in the grand scheme of things, a, a small piece of uh, the greater sustainable uh, solution. And, uh, but without participation, without cultivating that, uh, that, that next generation of torchbearers, we, we really can't have uh, what it is that, that we're hoping, we're hoping to, uh, to achieve. And so having heard everything, um, advocacy is exhausting. Uh, it, it is also as rewarding as it is exhausting. We, we have seen in, uh, in the last few years just how much uh, how big of a stride and, and leap that we've made into the public uh, space, but it's far from over. I mean, this is uh, this is just starting, and um, and I hope that this this event, this particular platform, can continue to be an anchor for many uh, scholars, advocates, and activists to come. Not just uh, not just of of our own communities or, or, or mind, uh, like minded uh, folks, but bringing on uh, the the other disenfranchised and marginalized voices as well and, and inviting and having this dialogue. Uh, I, I think that's going to be uh, really critical in our next uh, in our next steps of, uh, of fundamentally building uh, stronger uh, bonds, but also uh, what we envision uh, to to ensure that emerging uh, groups and voices and leadership is uh, are there. Uh, I am going to uh, call on uh, work in it for the next question. And then if uh, Muhammad Ali can uh, tee up the question after uh, work in it, uh, that would be great. I, in the interest of time here, uh, please uh, keep your questions brief. Um, we will try to get to everyone as much as we can. I, I believe we have uh, four <coughs> people uh, in queue. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lammi. Thank you, Karno, Marartu, Fatuma, and everyone. Uh, my question is for Karno, or if he is not here, it can work for, for, for Fatuma. There are tons of information that can easily convey the reality of the Oromo issues. As Marartu tried to make point earlier, 
it is unfortunate that the national media of Ethiopia is deliberately making all kinds of fictions, not only to hide the truth about Oromos, but also to inhumanize the beautiful culture of the Oromo people. They work so hard to make the Oromos question valueless. For example, the fundamental problem of Ethiopia is the systematic structural marginalization against the Oromo people. And yet the Oromos are the biggest majority in the world. I recently looked at the current bills of the US government about the peace, stability, and support towards democracy of the Ethiopia. But although the documents are good for the Oromos as well, the Oromos are rarely mentioned in the document. The US government must have all the reality of the Ethiopian falsehood strategy and the unfairly treated Oromos. How do you think we can get the attention that we deserve, at, at least from the US government? Where do, where do you think we failed in here? Thank you so much. But thanks uh, for the, the question. And <clears throat> uh, although I'm not familiar with the specific documents related to democracy and development from probably the State Department or the budget, I do understand uh, some of these concepts from my experience working in the interagency and working on different initiatives at, at the uh, White House. One of the areas where uh, oppressed groups or minority groups have been able to get to make inroads with US government policy and appropriations has been through uh, connection on principles. For instance, uh, around the world there are Christian groups that are minorities in different places and they'll raise their hand and say, hey, we're Christians, we need aid from the, the United States. But the leaders in Washington, the diplomatic leaders uh, who, who are at the embassy in Addis Ababa, they're going to um, be uh, influenced by what uh, Fatima was talking about earlier, the elites. So they're interacting with people who are elites who, who say that we're the central government, we are the only way, and don't worry about the complaints of these other people, we're the ones here whining and dining. And humans' behavior will be to, to operate at the under the influence of their host. And if you have a view that says it's too dangerous to travel into Central and South Ethiopia and get eyes on the ground, and if you are told day in and day out that those voices from the Oromo people, they're all liars and it's just disinformation and they're just complaining, um, then it's hard to influence the United States government. I know uh, Professor Kumsa has been working on issues of feminism for a long time, dedicated her life to it. And I'll give you an example of how uh, the Kurds have used the plight and the uh, fight of women to to galvanize some attention from the world to be able to influence U.S. policy. In North and East Syria and also in this uh, Shingal region, Sinjar region of Iraq, there are women fighters. You can look them up, YPJ fighters, and they wear these iconic scarves and they're fighting against ISIS. Well, um, now because of their their fight, there's been a, a book called The Daughters of Kabani that was written by uh, uh, one of my colleagues, Gail Simak Limon, that talks about these women who are fighting ISIS. There have been some documentary films and now there's going to be a feature film. Who's making the feature film? Hillary Clinton and Chelsea Clinton. Now, I don't know how much Hillary Clinton and Chelsea Clinton could ever imagine themselves uh, spending any time in Syria fighting ISIS, but they know a good story, and they're using the 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 you know woman power feminist angle to raise awareness for uh, the plight of Kurdish people. So I, my response is to say that sometimes it's riding those other or, or hitching your wagon to a bigger horse that can carry it into the destination that you want to go to. I'll pause there. Thank you so much. Is that okay if I ask you a follow-up question? Uh, we'll hold that because uh, Mr. Uh, Ali is on. 
uh, Q, but uh, if you can write that down or uh, send that through the chat, uh, through the direct message, I will make sure to, to get the follow-up in. Is that okay? All right, thank you. Thanks so much. I don't know if we are, I can't hear on my end. Um, How about anyone... now? Yeah, much better. Thank you. Uh, my question is directed to the colonel. Um, I said thank you for sharing uh, your knowledge about the uh, Kurdish suffering. Uh, and to me, the Kurdish suffering is very similar to that of the Oromo people in Ethiopia. I, I, I'll make it very short. Just four or five days ago, a woman in labor was burned with the house in which she was giving natural birth. If this kind of things were happened, say in, uh, Ukraine, it would have been a huge international issue that cannot, nothing, you know, there had never been a time when the majority, the Oromo are, I can't say the majority, but they are the single largest national group there. And they are, uh, there is a plan for reducing their population movement of population from other areas to Oromo areas, the urban centers basically <laughs> turned into anti-Oromo areas in the capital in Addis Ababa. You can't speak in Oromo language just now officially and then walk peacefully. How could we deal with this kind of things? How could we reverse this? And the people have already said the entire Ethiopian uh, uh, government, the media establishment, even those in the diaspora, they focus on one thing, on the Oromo. Their goal is to destroy the regional state of Oromia and then cut the Oromo population into eight or 10 different areas, making them the minority, essentially, and then their land will be taken over. How could we make this very clear uh, to the international community? Thank you. Uh, Muhammad Ali, thank you uh, for, your, for your question. This seems to be the question of the day. How do we make a difference? How do we make somebody care about the, the pregnant woman who is being burned uh, to death? And why does her life not matter as much as even the threat of the life of a Jewish person in Israel or even a Ukrainian in uh, Kiev. It, it's a complex question. I, I really don't have any quick answers, but I think uh, as, as Fatima mentioned that this advocacy, it takes a long time and it has to be a steady drumbeat. Sometimes it could be the big event of this woman being tragically burned, but it's really just the drumbeat and, and trying to get as many messages out and building uh, relationships with the stakeholders as much as possible and finding an advocate, sometimes an advocate who's well-placed in the State Department or the National Security Council or an international organization can be uh, very helpful to have someone inside the room. I know I spoke to some colleagues who in government who uh, focus on Africa more broadly about the Oromo situation. And as I reached out to them, my mostly answer I got back was crickets. Nobody wanted to talk about anything. And that was a surprise to me as these were some people who I've had a personal relationship with for more than a decade. And they treat uh, you know Oromo people like it's some sort of, um, hot issue that they don't want to be involved in. And there's just a, an apathy 
from some senior government officials, clearly in the United States, but probably also in other uh, world capitals and with international organizations for the fight. And I think if, there, if people did care, they would do something about it. Um, and I'm not sure what will make that, that difference for you, but all of the people who are on this meeting, I know care deeply about the issues. And I think there's clearly opportunity for more intellectual leadership that could be as simple as, as tweets, but it could also go to uh, scholarly writings that I know some of you have done, uh, books and op-eds, and it's just over and over and over again. And perhaps now there's an opportunity to compare and contrast what's happening in Ukraine and why does America care about Ukraine? What about uh, South and Central Ethiopia and the Oromia state comparing and contrasting the two to try to raise awareness in one of the national uh, papers of the United States or uh, UK? All right. Um, yeah, there, there, there is a lot of, um, there are a lot of barriers, uh, just to simply put, uh, to, to be able to get around. But uh, without persistence and perseverance, I, I, I think advocacy isn't going to work. So um, you have to figure out different ways to be able to get the issue out into the public sphere. So uh, for us uh, collectively, uh, for, for, for us uh, as advocates, um, and as we look at the, the current global state of affairs, we have to consider what does that issue or what does that cause mean to each of us and how are we impacted by it? And then how are we willing to, to be able to uh, tell, tell that, articulate that, in an eloquent fashion, sometimes it's not it's not about uh, playing the game or 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 being you know upset at the uh, the player or uh, at the, the the system itself. It's learning the game. It's learning how to uh, how to articulate your position, how to be able to uh, solidify your identity, and then uh, proceed from there on in in various forms, whether it's uh, actively engaging in discourse uh, by way of various mediums that are available to us, um, and um, also the, the scholarly work, the, the work to build institutions, and most importantly, the investing in youth. You have to continue to cultivate the next generation. So my call to action for, uh, for the Oromo Studies Association and other institutions that are emerging and, and are well established, put your money where your mouth is and invest in your youth to be able to take that to the next level because they are, are, are seeing uh, the examples of how advocacy is done before and it has not worked, uh, then it doesn't give them hope. So that they have to uh, investing in the youth and looking at the, the ways and, and the contributions that they can make can become the focal point of our advocacy. Uh, oftentimes we say advocacy doesn't necessarily mean speaking to the halls of power and having those in power uh, all of a sudden, you know, magically uh, fix our problems and make them go away. No, it has to start with investing and, and laying out a, a foundation that is going to sustain us in the long run, that, that slow drum beat that, that was mentioned. And I will, uh, with that, uh, send it off. Uh, the, I think there was a follow-up question. Um, uh, the the follow-up question was, uh, what are some strategies uh, to to be able to counter uh, falsehoods, um, and uh, particularly on the counterproductive messaging. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question, but that's the best way I can frame that. And that, that was directed towards, uh, towards you, Colonel. Oh. Okay, 
Uh, I'll just have a quick answer. And I think uh, I want to thank you, Lemmy, again, for inviting me and Meritu for your insights and Fatima for your insights and the, the good questions. But just to, to recap, um, to answer this last question and recap, I think in order to be effective for advocacy, you have to do a few things. Uh, one, as you're in an environment with information, it's not only the information that is against the Oromo people, Oromo people that you have to fight against. It's also everything else. People are paying attention in the United States to basketball. Uh, we've had uh, uh, World Cup uh, football soccer qualifiers that have happened this week. Uh, any number of natural disasters and economy and other oh. things that are going on in oh. Ukraine. So there's a lot of competition for information. In order to increase the awareness of what you're doing, I recommend, again, connecting with like-minded organizations with, uh, who have a similar interest, um, leveraging uh, charismatic uh, ambassadors and spokespeople who can talk to media, talk to stakeholders, and, and raise awareness and really connect with audiences across culture, uh, communicate in multiple languages to reach different stakeholder groups, and uh, make friends in high places. Friends in high places is essential. Some of those can be done through uh, social networks. Uh, several of you are at academic institutions who are working with in influential departments. And play up this narrative. We talked a little bit about the narrative. Play up this underdog narrative and you really have to draw some contrast. Those, those contrasts will be as, as you have lived, attacked vigorously and relentlessly by the state. And uh, I'm not here to you know, pick a side. I represent the United States government in some ways, but if you're ever you know, going up against the opposition in the communication space, you have to have this strong narrative and story and a thread that, that connects and resonates in an emotional way with people around the world to bring them to your side. And essentially your side just says, stop the abuse, stop the violence, stop the uh, artificial famine, and then uh, treat everybody with dignity and respect. There's nothing wrong with that. And most people around the world connect with those principles of human rights. So I thank you and I'll continue to follow your story as I continue my professional career. I'll pause there. Uh, bye from Manhattan, New York. Thank you, Colonel. We'll be in touch. Yes, thank you very much for joining us. Learned a lot from you. Thank you. Uh, that has been really a wonderful, uh, insightful conversation, really. This is going to be a template that we use to revamp our advocacy. And I appreciate the Colonel and all the panelists, especially Lummi Oz, uh, who had made a tremendous difference in our community in opening doors and getting things uh, through the Congress, and uh, I think we're in better shape because he's involved and a lot of people are involved. And so I really want to thank, we'll definitely keep you up to date uh, with our progress. I hope you'll jo join us in the future program. Thank you to everyone who have uh, joined us. Thank you, Lemmy and the Colonel Murar to and Fatuma. Many thanks to all of you for, for the opportunity to, to have uh, uh, to have some time and, and space on this uh, platform. Thank you. And I'll uh, ask the next panelist to get ready to, uh, to get prepared.